uh, having this lecture today, despite all the difficulties and blackouts Ukraine is facing. And we do hope that you will join us today and you can uh, listen to our lecture live or uh, on uh, social media. Yes, welcome from me too. Thanks, Mario, for, for this first introduction. Uh, this is lecture number eight of uh, the Roskvit Urban Coalition uh, for Ukraine Network. In indeed very uh, harsh and, and strange circumstances when we know that uh, the, the majority of, of, let's say, the target group uh, is unable to hear us live because of all the power cuts uh, that are going on in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, we had some doubts in, shall we still do this? Uh, because it's supposed to be a live meeting and we still hope uh, that a lot of you will see this, uh, but probably a lot of you not live. We hope we can give you the feeling of, of being live present. And for the future, we will think of ways on how to be more interactive also from a distance when you hear those lectures later. Indeed, it's on the YouTube channel of uh, Roskvit. Uh, you can find it uh, via our website roskvit.com. Uh, from there, you will find all the, the links to, to our several media, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, indeed the YouTube channel, where the seven previous lectures are also there. Uh, bilingual, so they are always uh, live translated as, is, as it is today. Uh, and at the same time um, uh, translated in both languages and recorded. Um, so let's kick off very quickly. Uh, today uh, we are very happy to have a lecture within uh, uh, one of our, uh, let's say, groups of work we're working on, and that has to do with identity, culture, heritage. So where actually uh, is, is all the activity in, in a country coming from? What is the background of it? And, and in this case, very specifically, uh, what is a home? What, uh, where do we feel at home? And what is the difference maybe between a home and being at home? Uh, a very uh, relevant discussion, we think, in, in these times uh, specifically. Uh, this is basically what we try to do with the lectures, uh, to have in all the different aspects that we're working on. We are an international coalition, as, as I said before, uh, but with different expertise and different persons. Uh, so the majority is coming from the Ukraine, uh, and another part is from all other parts of the world, but very familiar to the Ukraine or familiar with working in post-conflict or post-war circumstances. We're thinking on what aspects should we add to a conversation when we start thinking about rebuilding uh, Ukraine and uh, from what different angles can we look at it. So indeed, today uh, we are very happy to have two speakers who are going to tell about a project they have been working on for quite a while now, and they have been recently showing in the Netherlands, but which will be hopefully a traveling exhibition and coming on in, uh, in several places and hopefully very soon to Ukraine as well. Uh, it's called Homeland, uh, design reflecting on the loss of home. Uh, it has to deal with the definition of home, as I said before. Uh, it will reflect on the war, it affects on the stories of today, and it will cast a glance at possible futures. Our two lectures uh, will kick off themselves and, and tell much more about the project, but I will tell you something about them. Uh, we are very ha too happy to have the curator of the project, which is a uh, Tasha Chaspenko, uh, a bio designer and educator. I'm going to read this from my uh, book because it's a, a very long and, and interesting curriculum. Uh, she works with elements of art, fashion and material research. Uh, Dasha investigates alternative production processes in textile de design and is inspired by symbiotic relationships to nature. 
She collaborates with various human, but also non-human species, like fungi and edible plants. These collaborations, they result in grown garments, in tapestries and textile pieces. She does research on mycelium at the University of Utrecht and is a coach at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. Her works were shown in several venues in the Netherlands and in, for instance, uh, Haus de Cultura de Welt in Berlin uh, and very recently uh, in the Dutch Design Week with this project, uh, all kind of previous years uh, before also, but with this project in 2021, it just finished basically. The second speaker is uh, Mario van Schaik, a member of the Roskrit team and researcher of public space, cultural identity, and public and cultural values. After 20 years, uh, Mario resumed her work as a designer and maker of fabrics and clothes. She was educated earlier at the Fashion Academy uh, in Amsterdam in the 80s, but kind of dropped out of that profession because of an increasing um, yeah, awkwardness uh, with the commercialization of the fashion industry. She was an intendant of international cultural projects such as Europe by People in Amsterdam and Brussels and a designer of Downside Up in Soledad in Ukraine in 2021. Now she is working with wool and other natural materials such as hemp and vegetable dyes to create new concepts and products. The wool she works with comes from Dutch sheep which is considered basically a waste, a waste material. With her work, she wants to show the strength, the softness and the beauty of this so-called waste. Uh, I can't wait. I give you the floor. Uh, please share it. After uh, this lecture, indeed, you can ask questions to them. Please. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Lynette, for, for such a nice uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's an honor to be part of uh, Rosquit. It's my uh, first time in this uh, virtual space. It feels already very, very friendly. Uh, yeah, and it's really indeed a strange, uh, strange, uh, strange day with what happens with Ukraine and this indeed is a difficult and the situation to join that, but hopefully, uh, yeah. People will uh, find some time to hear us or to see us uh, online. Uh, I'll uh, uh, do this presentation uh, uh, in English, uh, just uh, so we are more consequent with, with Mario and the whole uh, working project process uh, of preparing this presentation was in English. So uh, it's a bit easier uh, for me to, to, to do it in English. Uh, all right, so I'm sharing the screen, right? Ah, uh, let's uh, let's try. I would ask someone for uh, for feedback if if it works. I'm a very um. We see your screen. Yes, we do. See my screen. That's really nice. Okay, so <laughs> almost there, and then I just need to find the uh, uh, the present button, which is <laughs> tricky for me. In a, in PDF, uh, one one second. So it's a uh, full full screen too. No. Um. I'm also not uh, extremely good in that. So maybe. Ah, uh, it it needs it needs to be somewhere. Hey, maybe. Um, I'll, I'll ask. Shortcut um, uh, command L. Command L. Okay. Ah, yes, great. Great, <laughs> and I need to hide you guys. Um, well, uh, Homeland, so uh, are you? We're a bit improvising here, uh, so we can do it together. Maybe, uh, technically, we thought okay, I first half I talk a bit, then Mario talks a bit, but uh, I think uh, we can add on each other. So, in case in the beginning I miss something, or Mario, you feel like uh. Yeah, this, this needs to be told exactly at that moment, then please uh, please uh, interrupt and add on, okay? So we also make it more uh, 
more life and also uh, with that if you if you have some questions uh, open up uh, around the process please uh, great please ask okay well so uh, that's uh, our our main poster uh, and uh, it's very straightforward in a way that the first thing that you see the in fact the flag of ukraine but uh, if you zoom in and if you uh, look closer you could see that uh, in fact it's a uh, biomaterial uh, which consists out of uh, lufa which is a uh, cucumber type of vegetable and uh, mycelium so in fact uh, it's a metaphor for our exhibition which uh, uh, tells uh, a story uh, of ukraine but uh, through the prism of uh, natural materials covering different uh, layers and uh, and stories so um all right, now <laughs> I need to find a way how to move, uh, move, move, move the slide. Yeah, okay. Uh, so when we started, um, when we started the work on this exhibition, uh, the war was there and uh, our team, we were all uh, in the Netherlands, more or less uh, going to Ukraine, uh, but we knew that we need to uh, communicate what what happens in our country but uh, it was uh, quite uh, quite tricky uh, because by by being in the netherlands and uh, we all had uh, quite quite um, various experience on what is happening and uh, um, it was a very big question uh, experience in that situation how to talk about war uh, through the experience uh, that, uh, that 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 we all had and then in the end we decided that um, our goal is within uh, that project to show uh, Ukraine uh, as a country uh, with a very strong um, identity, with uh, traditions uh, which were there uh, throughout generations, with uh, deep uh, knowledge uh, about nature, but uh, also at the same time uh, as a country which is uh, uh, on the cutting edge of what happens uh, within the world. And uh, um, from my own experience, um, uh, many people in Europe and also in the Netherlands, uh, they found out about Ukraine uh, only from the images of war, of this uh, really scary images. And then they said, yeah, but we actually would love to know more about this country. So our ultimate goal was uh, to show this, uh, this, this DNA of Ukraine. If it's possible to to say it that way. Um, so um, yeah, we the, the process was always uh, almost like black and white binary. We always worked in contrast. We took uh, traditions, uh, we took uh, ancient knowledge, which is uh, really deeply rooted uh, in Ukraine, and then we tried to try to uh, connect that with. Uh, science and with innovation. And as the process uh, and the preparation of this exhibition uh, was uh, in the Netherlands, we thought uh, it's nice to, to, to contextualize it and not to uh, limit it to only Ukrainian makers and artists, but actually make a combination of both and to show a work uh, which is done uh, by both Ukrainian uh, artists, designers, scientists, and uh, Dutch. Uh, but uh, also another aspect was uh, that uh, not to show the work which was done before and uh, in that context the work which was done before was actually the work which was done before the war but we thought it actually would be great to uh, uh, to make a new process and to put uh, Ukrainian and Dutch uh, artists together uh, and to uh, allow the process to happen in the circle circumstances that uh, are now and to embody uh, experiences of both Ukrainian and Dutch designers uh, in the situation uh, which, 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 which was uh, there now. Uh, from my personal experience, uh, I for 23 years I lived in Ukraine and uh, for uh, seven years I uh, lived in the Netherlands. So the concept of home for me was uh, very relevant even before homeland and uh, before before this uh, situation um, and somehow yeah you're always in between and uh, uh, for me Netherlands 
uh, became almost home. Uh, and the funny thing that was that for Mayor, and she, she might talk about it later, was that uh, almost before the war, uh, she was supposed to get a home, an apartment in, uh, in Ukraine, in Kiev or in Kharkiv. So Ukraine was a place uh, to be her home in one way or another. So, uh, for, for, for all the team of the project, Ukraine and the Netherlands was both uh, a, a place of home. A bit about uh, myself, because it also relates a bit to the context of that exhibition. I have a background in uh, architecture. Um, yeah, and uh, then uh, throughout the years, and actually throughout the years in the Netherlands, I uh, transited into microbiology. So my process was really uh, declining from starting from big, uh, to interior design, to performance, I ended up in, in microbiology, and uh, now I uh, actually work at the lab of Utrecht University and, uh, research, and do research on biomaterials using uh, microscopes, uh, small petri dishes. Um, this is uh, some some of the examples of, uh, of 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 my work. So my focus is uh, bio-based fashion, bio-based textile in terms of actually uh, production, alternative production method, but also uh, in terms of uh, future and uh, how would we uh, coexist with uh, this type of fashion when it would really enter our, um, our life. Um, so that's uh, actually hemp and mycelium two materials that uh, I'm uh, mostly busy at, uh, at the moment. And th those are some uh, prototypes of uh, fabric uh, which we uh, develop and produce. This is a wall, wall of my studio, which is filled uh, with, with samples. So yeah, here you can see uh, two, two protagonists, uh, cannabis sativa, which is industrial hemp and traumatus betulina. This is a mushroom. So, uh, industrial hemp, hemp, right, is something which is very common in uh, in Ukraine, and uh, actually through through hemp, uh, Ukraine uh, entered my uh, my practice as a designer because uh, being myself from Ukraine for for all uh, seven years that I worked in the Netherlands, somehow this um, uh, geographical place of birth or identity never uh, entered my my research question or my scope of work. So. Uh, uh, it started to enter even before the war started through through camp because on a practical level simply I uh, couldn't get camp in the Netherlands so I had to find ways to get it from Ukraine where it was uh, in abundance and then on the right side you could see a, a mushroom which is uh, quite native to, to the Netherlands so for me uh, last years it was a combination of Ukraine and the Netherlands through the combination of uh, two materials, uh, both native to uh, Ukraine and uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, and here you could see uh, a very big contrast. So something very crafty made out of hemp and something very uh, scientific uh, mushroom. So um, that also was like a red line of our exhibition. You could see uh, something very uh, crafty made by hemp made by uh, labor by manual techniques and something very uh, scientific and uh, innovative. So here you could see uh, yeah, like this pompons made out of hemp and the lion mane's mushroom, which look in fact the same, but are from completely two different uh, uh, words. Here uh, on this image, you could see uh, those who are from Ukraine know, you could see um, on the uh, left side, uh, this is a tool to make a gunya or a lizhnik, it's something very typical to Ukraine. It's a lizhnik is a blanket common for the Carpathian region. Uh, and uh, they use this type of tool for the post process to make it uh, strong and flatty. And uh, it's almost the same thing as you see on the right side, but it's in the lab in the Netherlands where mushrooms are grown. Um, yeah, and this is completely two different types of lit literature. One on uh, traditions, on symbols, on something uh, which was developed uh, throughout generations. Uh, those am amulets, 
that protect us. And uh, on the right hand, you can see protocols and rules um, how to work with uh, biomaterials. Uh, here, here you could see a, um, a weaver from the Archeon Museum in the Netherlands who taught us how to spin yarn and how to use your body to, uh, yeah, to make uh, buns of it. And on the right side, you could see a scientist with a petri dish who taught us how to, uh, yeah, how to inoculate a mushroom in the hemp. And here you could see uh, also almost the same shells, but then with very crafty, uh, yeah, like a hobby shop which sells wool. And on the other hand, you, you see uh, a drugstore with very dangerous <laughs> chemicals which uh, microbiologists use. But then, in fact, you can put them together and get the results. Yeah, here you could see in Ukraine uh, from uh, Yavorif uh, a combing tool which combs wool to make um, to, to make it workable uh, in order to felt or to weave or to spin. And uh, on the right hand, you see a shaker. So in fact, those are supposed to be videos, but this is a PDF, so I won't show you. So you need to <laughs> trust me on that. Um, so yeah, that's some some images from from my work, and those contrasts were uh, always always there, and somehow they also entered our our exhibition. And then somehow when when we sort of a title uh, home home, we knew we were talking about home, uh, because home uh, was relevant both uh, for Ukrainian people who had to flee to different countries, but also to uh, to, to to other people, and uh, in our case, Dutch people who suddenly had to meet a lot of Ukrainian people and to 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 see what home means for them, and also to ask themselves, okay, but what what home actually means uh, means for us? How it is to be out of home? Is home inside of us actually? Is it something physical? Is it the geography? Is it um, is it the tradition? Is it the rituals? or the family, the people who are around, or the food we eat, what, what it is, and can we actually find a home all together, being on, a, on one territory, or temporarily, or, or another territory. So yeah, all, all these questions we were constantly asking ourselves. And um, it's one thing to talk about it, but uh, a totally different thing is actually to communicate it through design. Uh, through the language of design, and that was the challenge that we put ourselves. And here uh, you could see this play of words, right? Home and land. Uh, so land, land for us was a framework, right? So we talk about home through land, and then in that case, land was uh, the framework of all the materials that land uh, provides for us, which are uh, biomaterials. And this is also another uh, red thread of the exhibition. You could see, uh, again, the contrast, but almost the same aesthetics. But uh, on the left side, you could see the Ukrainian uh, gunya. So I guess people from Ukraine uh, know uh, what it is very well. So it's a shepherd's jacket that uh, people from the mountains, Hutsuls, used to wear, and actually some of them still are, uh, wearing for protection from the weather elements, from uh, from the animals, but also it was believed to be an amulet, a thing that protects you. So someone who has a gunia was uh, believed to be protected from uh, from the heaven, from also some spiritual things. And uh, on the other, on the right side, you could see a uh, fungus, uh, which is called lion's mane. So lion's mane, because sometimes they call it monkey's head, uh, but because it has round shape, uh, but it grows mainly from uh, from trees. Uh, and then when I, um, they look actually the, the same way. And then immediately when I had these images in mind, I had a question, oh, but could, could we make actually a gunya, which is normally made up out of wool grown out of these mushrooms, right? Could we instead of wool use uh, the mushroom? And then, uh, yeah, that became like a, a question for the exhibition. And then all the in-between steps that led to that, uh, it turned out that they could also tell a lot of stories uh, about Ukraine, about materials, about wool, about mushrooms, and uh, yeah, many, many, many other things. So yeah, this is a proper who actually wears a, a gunya. Um, 
yeah, here you can see that uh, from from being a workwear for shepherds, it actually became uh, a garment that people wore for weddings, for funerals, from for special for special events. So you can see a, um, a wedding. Well, and that's actually that was our reference here. You could see the the work that we did. On the left side, you could see a gunya, which was actually weaved from Carpathian wool by an uh, amazing Ruslana von Charuk, who came especially from uh, from the Carpathian mountains, from Yavorif to the Netherlands, and uh, where she had a, a residency where she taught us how to make it, and she, she, she did it. And on the right side, you could see a gunya, uh, which is uh, made exactly using the same stencil, the same pattern, but uh, in that case, it's done out of um, canop and uh, and mycelium. So okay, it's not uh, not the lion's mane mushroom, but uh, it's uh, it's a mushroom. So from from a classical woolen one to a one which is uh, grown in a, in a lab. Uh, and then uh, that was actually one storyline of our exhibition. So uh, we took a, a gunya. Uh, as a as a symbol of uh, protection, because we so said, okay, uh, to basic things, what makes us feel at home? And uh, uh, the first thing it's it's a basic need. You feel at home when you're protected, and it became really evident since since the war started. So protection is uh, is the basic thing. So and the gunya being an amulet and a physical thing that makes you warm uh, is is something that protects you. So we decided to um, make uh, certain gunyas, and each gunya would tell something about uh, our country, about materials, or about something else. For example, here you could see a gunya, uh, which uh, is weaved using the traditional technique. Uh, but uh, what's interesting about it is that it is dyed uh, with, uh, with borscht, as you could have guessed. Because uh, interesting uh, that uh, even uh, now in the Carpathian Mountains, uh, craftsmen still use, uh, not still, but they actually use dyes uh, that are uh, brought from India or from China. But funnily enough, from uh, their parents or grandparents, they know the recipes of natural dyes because that's how they used to dye back in time. And actually, they still can do it because uh, nature, especially the Carpathians, they can provide natural ingredients, but it's just too complicated to do it. So in this story, we uh, decided to take borscht, something that everyone cooks and each family has its own recipe, and take leftover ingredients and to use them for making uh, dyes and to show that it's actually nice to to use natural dyes uh, again. Uh, and here you could see also a very uh, nice uh example which actually combines this craft uh, with, with science because that was a gunya which was weaved uh, from uh, ukrainian wool right from ukrainian ships but then it was dyed you see this pink color and uh, you would never guess but it comes from from fungus so we um, asked a, a dutch um, scientist fashion fashion designer who uh, who works on uh, retrieving dyes colors from fungus from mushrooms so uh, in, in in our case she got uh, this pink color and uh, yeah so this coat was co colored by by mushroom um, here you could see something completely different so this is a set of tableware and again for those people who are from ukraine these shapes uh, seem might seem very familiar that's something you know it's very traditional uh, but what's interesting about it is that uh, they, in fact, are uh, 3D printed. Uh, why, why ceramics? Because ceramics actually, not ceramics, it looks like ceramics, but in fact, this is not tableware. So another story besides Gunas uh, is tableware. And we thought, okay, what, um, what, what else is home? And the second thing after protection and being safe, being at home, uh, meant to us, to, to have your loved people around, but also to have some shared time with them. And sometimes, very often it happens by having food right together. So when you eat together, when you cook your favorite recipe, uh, you feel at home, uh, even if you're, if you're far away from your geographical home. But also even the fact when you have a plate which you brought 
from home or even a cup or something that reminds you of home or a shape of a jar, like in this case, uh, you have this notion of home. So we decided to uh, have uh, four stories of uh, different tableware that would uh, tell different stories about uh, Ukraine. So in that case, it's a work of uh, Sasha Popruha, uh, Ukrainian uh, artist who in Ukraine works actually with recycled plastic. And then with the war, she came to Rotterdam where she collaborated uh, with Stein van Ardenne, who is an expert in this huge uh, 3D printing. So uh, what they did, uh, Sasha took traditional Ukrainian shapes uh, and then uh, asked Stein to 3D print them. But the interesting part of the project is that they didn't use plastic, as it often happens with 3D printing, but they actually used materials which are local to, to the Dutch landscape so they used miscanthus which is a grass which grows almost in every uh, courtyard even in, in the cities it also grows in the dunes next to the sea in the hay then they used um, uh, starch from potatoes and then uh, they used a beeswax which also came from the Carpathian mountains to make these objects uh, waterproof and uh, um, it's really a shame that you you can't actually touch this objects or smell because it's all about that. They smell really like home. They smell like meadow, they smell like honey, they smell like flowers that we know. And sometimes also this notion of home, it comes um, not only through theory or through uh, knowledge, but through sensation, right? You feel a smell or you have a familiar texture to touch and immediately on unconscious level, you have a notion of, uh, of home. Then this is uh, another table set, but then uh, for me, uh, I really like this project a lot and uh, it's actually political because uh, what you see here is like a, a collection of nesting bulls with some uh, people and it's made uh, by Charlotte Wieser. And normally she's a Dutch ceramist and Charlotte works with salt. So after making ceramics out of clay, she uses salt to create a glaze. So uh, the salt is put in the kiln, in the oven, and then uh, it evaporates, it makes a chemical reaction, and uh, you never know, it makes unexpected textures and glazes. So what we did in this project, we um, brought Charlotte salt from uh, Ukraine. And then, in fact, from uh, three different uh, parts of Ukraine where salt is produced. And at that moment, uh, all, uh, so all the places where salt uh, was produced were, um, yeah, were damaged uh, due to the war. And uh, some, some stopped producing salt, some had difficulties. And in fact, even the process of getting the salt from Ukraine and bringing it to the Netherlands was already a research project in itself. And then Charlotte combined all these three salt, put them in the oven, and these three types of Ukrainian salt created this uh, glaze. So in fact, this table set is a memory of, of Ukrainian salt, is like a monument of Ukrainian salt put together. And on a symbolic level, it, it unites all three places. So it's a very powerful uh, metaphor. Uh, and here you could see um, Sitska Kloster. It's also a Dutch artist who works with milk. And what she does, uh, well, she makes uh, degustations of milk. And her goal is to bring uh, people, Dutch people in her case, uh, back back to the farmers and to show them um, yeah, where, where milk comes from. Uh, and uh, what, what we did, I don't have an image, actually Mario will show you later on in, uh, in her slide. We, all, we know that in Ukraine, milk is used a bit in a different way. Yes, of course, they drink it as well. But throughout generations, we used milk to create a glaze for, uh, for ceramics. So we uh, put together um, Sitska Kloster, uh, who gives Dutch uh, people Dutch milk to try, and uh, Oksana Denisevich, who uses milk as a, as a place. Oksana Denisevich lives in Khotiv, and she makes her own ceramics. So uh, we were drinking milk, milk which comes from the Netherlands, but from a uh, uh, tableware which was uh, glazed. Uh, by milk, by Ukrainian milk from Ukrainian uh, farmers. It was a also beef exchange project talking about resource, which is milk, but also telling uh, a lot of stories, stories about Ukrainian farmers and how they 
uh, how they live with with the war, how they still do their job, how yeah, how they still work with milk. Uh, and uh, yeah, it all happened when we were drinking uh, Dutch Dutch milk. Um, wow, um, something to 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 tell about the space. It was um, yeah, we had quite some difficult time with with the space. We got an amazing uh, big. Uh, place but then uh when we entered it was quite hard to 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 work but then in the end we found this um this way of uh showcasing our research and the whole process on this uh, uh concrete uh plinths concrete uh podiums and um somehow not not meaning that but when when the exhibition was there space-wise when people entered the space they also could read what is presented in many many different uh, um, layers so yeah that's some some to give you some overview um, unfortunately the photos don't really um, show the whole thing because in fact in our case it was a lot about touching about smelling about feeling uh, yes and about talking of course and about hearing uh, all, all those stories but um, they are planning to make a, a book where you write and because all, all the stories that that are involved of all the uh, makers farmers designers um scientists yeah so i think uh, some some impressions from my side and i uh, i'm super yeah, happy to uh, yeah, pass it on to to my favorite colleague uh, Mario, with whom it was a, an amazing pleasure to work not only on the uh, curation of that exhibition, but also on uh, creating the the, the, the gunas and learning a lot uh, in, in in that process. So thank you. Thank you, Dasha. And as you know, it was completely mutual. I think we, um, <laughs> it was having a lot of fun, but also inspiration. And um, and maybe also, this is interesting um, because your research is always the, the binary type of thing. So with the, with the nature and the, um, and and actually the lab is also nature, I would say, but let's say kind of- Yes, <laughs> man-made nature. <laughs> yes, and yeah. for me, um, I started to do research when I was working in practice. So I was uh, trying to to make a new a culture venue in one of the outskirts of Amsterdam, and then actually, I, suddenly the question was, why are we building new culture venues if we want to have a different type of theater or a different type of audiences? And uh, this started as a, as a research, and, um, but I did it always next to my daily practices being either uh, uh, initiating new projects or uh, as a, a strategist or director for already running uh, projects and venues. So um, my research is mostly uh, written. And the thing is that indeed I was very much uh, la the last five years more and more involved in Ukraine. And last year, this time we were in uh, Ukraine. We is uh, Filko, my husband and I together. And I did a project there, but also I decided um, I went to, uh, I decided to take my small um, how would you say it, a uh, weaving tool and um, to do some experiments. So the shop uh, Dasha just showed in Kiev, I have a favorite yarn shop. I had a favorite yarn shop in Kharkiv and I did a lot of shoppings there. I have this huge uh, yarn tool, um, how would you say it? Well, spools of, of uh, and I was really doing a lot of weaving there and thinking about small projects and ideas. Coming back, uh, I started to write this other thing, which was called a plea for radical change of culture venues, which asked for a different way of looking at culture venues. And it was not yet finished, almost finished on the 24th of February. And then, well, as you all know, the world changed quite a lot, uh, hugely in Ukraine, but I think also for at least in, in my world. And so after that, I started to think also more about this identity of places, what happens. So 
uh, what happens indeed with the idea of home and what does it mean and also what makes spaces uh, places specific what makes them that you uh, really that you feel something about it and uh, I wrote an article uh, for on behalf of Roskreet for a magazine, um, no, not a magazine, sorry, a conference. I don't know yet whether it will be accepted, but then I wrote, I went more deeply, so not so much in culture venues, but more on another level in what makes the identity of places, which is very much in line with our uh, design um, research of homeland so what makes the identity and that's uh, more or less uh, well, what i found out that it's very much about uh, memory uh, individual memory and collective memory but also about safety and control so if that's the next slide um i made them in a kind of a circle if you make it not only on places but more on general uh, level, you could say the three levels uh, are always uh, influencing each other. So you have your personal relations to society, to the world around you, uh, and to the place where you are. Uh, you have um, the community's uh, relations to society, and that's a lot of networks that can be concrete and abstract networks as well. Uh, and the memory. So it's actually, you could say it's about being, about society and about time. That's the three, if you then, for those who know, this is a um, relation to Lefebvre's uh, tri trialectic of being. And uh, what you see at the moment, especially this memory aspect is very huge. It's about individual and collective, and it's also linked to political strategies, but it's also very much always related to your own network and your own memory. So it's always on, it's, you could say it's going backwards and forwards and you, the one is influencing the other. And just uh, to illustrate it in a very easy way uh, with the building, that's the next slide, Dasha is um, some people would relate much more to I'm uh, I like to go to the opera and they would like to relate to the opera house in Kiev which is a I would say a very classic building and um, and some people are really in front of this type of architecture but not only of this, this type of art architecture also the way opera is done in the Kiev uh, opera house is very traditional uh, so uh, many people are happy with it, but it also it all, always relates to your memories, to where you are from, your individual uh, uh, taste and takes. And then the next slide uh, shows kind of an opposite one, one of the... Um, uh, so Dasha, if you could uh, show the next one. This is a, a, a design of Oleg Drozdov. Um, one of the um, founders of Roskvit, and uh, I always forgot the name of the street. It's linking uh, Podil to the upper uh, uh, city. It's the street which is going like this for in Kiev, and and then it makes the turn. Dasha, can you help me out? What's the name of the street? Andrievsky. Yeah, yeah. And Andrievsky Street. <laughs> and this is the uh, a national theater and it's very contested. So uh, some people or many people in Kiev were really uh, upset about this building while, while others really liked it. And part of the upset or liking was indeed also the context. So it was not only their own memories or how you used to know the theater and it was it was clear that it needed to be redone but also because the rest of the street is kind of some people would say it's falling apart and other would say it's more classical some people did like it because it reacted to and it answered to what was happening in the street and others said no it's well you can imagine and it's important to have this in mind uh, and this was also important to have this in mind because then going to the homeland and our exhibition, which is the next uh, slide, um, it's about identities and it's including history and future. So if you saw the pictures uh, Dasha so, uh, showed of the Gunya, it can be, uh, and also later on the picture with the traditional embroidery of uh, Ukraine, and then working in the lab with the BioThink, it's both there. 
And it's not about uh, having to choose or saying I, I like or don't like. And especially also now in looking what is important to know about Ukraine, but also when you're going to think about rebuilding, uh, you, you know, we know the, 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 the topics are, are we going to rebuild um, places as they were, were before? And then always we have the Warsaw example, or are we, are we going to build something completely new as if it's a, the, um, uh, how is it called? And um, the um, Raza, well, the white paper, the white page, it's another name, but uh, um, and we think, yeah, <laughs> and we thought and we think it's very important that it shouldn't be an either or. So that's the next um, uh, slide is showing. Uh, you see the, the traditional Gunya on the left side, and we see something which is really innovative as it's now, but we use the old template. So it's new, it's a complete new way of uh, making fabric. And it's still in research, but in the end, we think it can become a, a real new way of making fabric, maybe at home, that you grow your own textile. And at the same time, it's so close to each other and also cl so close um, to the historic line. So the next one uh, is, is uh, we decided th that was the other very important uh, line. It's tradition, it's innovation, and it's about circularity. And this is, I think, also in the, in the bigger picture of rebuilding Ukraine. It already was a topic. Uh, it was not... Uh, and it was already the idea that uh, Ukraine could be now suddenly a front runner because there was a lot of thinking about reusing materials, but also reusing or using uh, natural resources. So, but now it's even more urgent to think about it. And that's the next slide. Uh, so we thought from the one side about the resources, so it was wool, it was hennep, but it was also new resources like uh, using the my mycelium. It was about reuse, reuse of uh, not necessarily material, but also of techniques and innovation. And then the next slide shows, um, so this is one of the resources, which is uh, always a bit, I, th I think it's always a kind of an incredible story that in the Netherlands, we have a lot of sheep and we have those sheep for meat and the wool is something uh, in the old days we used it, but from the 1770s uh, onwards of last century, we uh, imported softer types of wools and also we had a lot of chemical mixtures. So viscose with wool, which made it stronger, which made it softer, which made it not itchy. So in the end, we are now in a situation where we have wool and it's waste. And what even puzzled me more was that then I can understand the whole process which happened in the 70s. I was a kid who was very happy that I didn't have to wear anymore the itching uh, pools. So that was quite clear. But then in the beginning of this century, we had in the Netherlands more and more uh, mostly elderly women who started to do hobby a type of thing and working with wool, felting and spinning and weaving. And then suddenly they didn't use, and they don't use the wool of those sheep, of the Dutch sheep, but they use a uh, wool of uh, important wool of very, I, I always call them posh sheep. And actually you cannot explain it. The, the people say that the, the Dutch wool is more difficult to handle, but it's not that difficult. And the funny thing is also, I think it's a hobby. So if it's a hobby, it might be a bit complicated. It shouldn't be too easy. So it's, it's, you can really not explain that if you look at this, uh, the, the brown one is from a very special sheep and the white one is from a regular sheep. And if I would have to buy the, the material for the brown one, I had to pay uh, something like 90 euros. And the farmer has to pay uh, to get rid of the, uh, of the brown and the white wool. And that would have been, something uh, like five euros to pay as garbage. So it's, it's you, you, cannot, you, you cannot explain it. And it's also uh, maybe it's symbolic for how in the Netherlands we, we work with our resources. 
And then the next slide um, is a different one about resources, because then you see this is uh, actually the right one is a woolen gunya, and this is uh, from uh, Carpathian wool. And the sheep there are, uh, maybe they are better, um, they, they are better used to cold and warm weather, weather, but they are actually more or less the same sheep as we are, we have. So it's not any special kind of breed or whatever. It's just regular sheep. And um, the, the, the fluffy uh, part is a, a weaving technique. So it has nothing to do with that the sheep is more hairy or less hairy. It's a, it's a technique of weaving. You can see it better on the left side, how it is. So it's it's weaving tapestry. And then while weaving it, uh, Ruslana uh, knots into it the long uh, strands. And the technique, so it's, it's a very old technique, actually also in the 70s, I think, for those who, uh, who were into it, we did Smyrna. It, it's uh, making a kind of tapestry and this is a, a technique to do it. And at the left side also, you see, this is also interesting. So this is not wool. It resembles wool, but this is hemp, a mixture of hemp with viscose. And it's a tryout to, to see whether it can have the same um, characteristics as with the wool. But then you see uh, both are dyed with uh, the natural ingredients of borscht. But then the one, so the wool completely blended and with the uh, hemp, it didn't. It was also more difficult on the hemp, hemp viscose to get it, um, that it uh, caught, that it really caught uh, color. So, uh, and with the hemp viscose, we are quite sure that if we uh, put it in the water, it will, be, uh, it will be not water resistant like the woolen one. So the funny thing is, they are both quite heavy to wear, but if you wear the woolen one, it will protect you against cold, but also against water, because uh, the technique makes it water resistant, while with the hemp one, you will be soaked and you will end up completely cold and very heavy. So the next one uh, is also about, uh, um, we use of technique, and then indeed the left one shows, the left picture shows, shows the, the milking. So you see, it's a bit difficult to see on this picture, but the small, a bit yellow, uh, well, it's not even cups, it's uh, things I would say, are the things, the ceramics Sitzke made. And she made them as cups to, to taste the milk, while the one more in front and the dark ones to the left are cups made by uh, Oksana. And she, uh, uh, she used as a glazing technique, the milk. And the longer it's in the oven, the darker it becomes. And at the inside, you see of the one most in the middle, you see painting. And those different paintings belong to different regions in Ukraine. And actually even uh, there, are the, the milk is from different farmers and the farmers tell when Oksana is collecting the milk there, she, the, the farmers are telling her stories and she uh, in a way um, uses those uh, stories while painting the insides. The right one uh, um, Dasha already to, uh, uh, talked about. So this is using uh, salt. And what, but what she didn't say is that many people who are ceramic experts were quite impressed because uh, doing ceramics or ba uh, baking with salt is quite complicated. And uh, most people always experience then everything falls apart or it becomes too warm or whatever. And this kind of result we had, or Charlotte had with the uh, ceramics with salt uh, was really amazing. It was of a, of a quality which is incredible. And we, um, um it's of course not really we tell each other that this is because we had so much difficulty to, to, to get this salt and that it's really specific salt and cared for salt from ukraine yeah. then the next uh, slide 
Um, here you see uh, the, the innovation, the, the, the right one you already saw with the mycelium. The left one, it's really specific because it's a very, it's the traditional uh, template, the tra traditional model. And then it was dyed with uh, mycelium as uh, Dasha explained. But here you also see that we did it was also uh, finding out and experimenting what happens because when it first came out, um, our dying bath uh, or uh, Ilse's dying bath, it was completely, it was red or pink like meat, uh, minced meat. And then when we made the photo shoot, it was still pink. And then the smell was completely con con contradictory with the, uh, with the looks. Because if you look at it, you think it's pink. So you expect something sweet. And if you touch it, it is sweet. So you really expect again something sweet. And if you put your nose in it, it really smelled like uh, decay, uh, like mushrooms rotting in a, in, a, in a forest. So some people like it and others hated it. But the interesting part is mostly that it didn't smell like how you uh, what you would expect, what your other senses tell that would happen. And another thing which happened with this one was also very uh, spectacular is that in the week of the design week, it, it uh, dramatically changed color. And so if you would lift the, the long hairs like this, uh, under it would be still have the pink uh, color, but on top, it, uh, it, it was not only fading, but it became a bit more, um, how would you say, brownish, yellowish. So we are very curious to see what happens with this one. And I think then we come to the next and maybe the last one, or there is another one, I'm not quite sure. Uh, the next one is the last one. And this is showing all people who were um, working with, with whom we were working together. So you can see it was a large uh, group and it was also very uh, a mixture. So it was um, Ukrainian, Dutch, and even one German, Basse Stichen is a, a German designer, but working in the Netherlands. And what I really very liked very much is indeed, for example, that Sietzke made her ceramics in the Netherlands, then we shipped them to uh, Oksana de Nuzevoosh, and she milked them there, and then we shipped them back to the Netherlands. So it was a constant uh, exchange. Yeah, but same with I the think this is the last one. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, same with the Guinness. They were some were lived in Ukraine and then died in the Netherlands. And then the recipes were we experimented and died here and then I shipped the recipes to Ruslana and then the Carpathians she died. So it was always this exchange in a way. So we, we learned a lot ourselves. <laughs> and maybe uh, what's also interesting to to conclude, maybe more or less, but this is that for all Dutch designers, it was really, um, they felt honored, but it was also inspiring and opening up a, a lot of new perspectives. And the Ukrainian designers, they were also, uh, they were excited to work with the Dutch ones, not only for inspiration and technique, but also, uh, and I think this is still uh, very important, uh, that they were so happy to work on something which is positive and which is connecting with positive ideas, home and homelands, and working on something uh, instead of only, uh, yeah, only, but instead of uh, the image of the war to put something else, um, which, which also could make them happy. So this is it, I think. Yes, this sounded like the end. Great. Great. Can I stop sharing now? <laughs> yes, good. Uh, all right. Great. Thank you so much. What a fantastic story and what a fantastic project. Uh, I, I knew a little bit of it, but uh, hearing all these connections and all these lines and, and uh, the wealth of it, uh, I, I think you can pick so many different aspects uh, from it, uh, which you already uh, hinted at um, 
of course, talking about innovation, talking about uh, resources, talking about uh, how to deal with uh, reconstruction and and notions of of memory and and future building, uh, plus dealing with with identity and the home feeling. That's like uh, six subjects in in one project, uh, and and I think that makes it so extremely rich and and so many things you could. I think you can show this project and and have. Uh, five or six different uh, debate sessions around it or or conferences or booklets or whatever uh, themes you 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 can pick and and use this as as an example uh so i'm i'm looking a little bit um, wh where to start with my question but one was was very uh, practical basically uh i don't know no it's not practical it's more more personal um because i your personal relationship uh dasha which you told uh in the beginning uh with materials from the country and the idea of of what that home materials would be was when you were working with the hemp and and looking into that and then suddenly you you were projected back to ukraine uh, more or less and 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 felt that connection uh, so my question to you would be uh, if how that related also and if that has influence on, on the work you are uh, uh, doing now and then immediately pose uh, the question to Mario if you uh, had the same kind of ideas about uh, Dutch materials you, you were talking about the wool but that was kind of of basically negative sin thing of of not using it anymore but are there did you become let's say attached to some material or or this that feeling of of being home uh, was augmented by seeing or touching those materials so maybe dasha first ah uh, yeah good question Lynette. thank you yeah in fact uh, you're right so uh, there was a practical need to, to actually get hemp and I start in Ukraine it was easier even with the fact that it was shipped and I really had to pay for the shipping of that hemp from Ukraine but still it was cheaper easier to do it that way and then somehow from really practical reasons I started to ask okay but how comes it in Ukraine it's actually uh, easier than in the Netherlands while Netherlands has the other connotation with hemp and one would think that yeah there, there should be a lot of it but then I started to dig, dig into that and I, I started to discover uh, the historical background of hemp. And uh, for example, in Poltavska Oblast, we, we have this uh, Beef Hemp uh, uh, Research Institute, which is in fact very famous worldwide um, in the field of uh, hemp growers. And people from all over, all over the world, they go there for advice, expertise and uh, research. And in fact, they're also in the Guinness record book because for more than 70 years, I might uh, be mistaken, but something like that. Uh, they have been doing the same experiments on one plot of land. So in fact, growing the same culture on one land and seeing how the soil uh, changes with that and know where in the world they've did it for so long. So that's, uh, that's very precious. And by that, I also started to work with people in hemp. So I, I met Oksana Devo, for example, who is into hemp and she was one uh, of the artists who also exhibited in our exhibition. And then uh, by doing this hemp research, I actually met uh, Ruslana Goncharuk from Yavori, who became a key figure in our exhibition because she was an inspiration and uh, one of the main makers of all the uh, Ukrainian Guinness. So from, from, from that, from this practical question, how to get a resource, uh, yeah, I started to dig in also people and their ways to work in and then uh, inevitably it also lead to okay because i was still my base was in the netherlands how to uh, combine not only resources that, that are here and there but also people their expertise and also different ways of working and different type of knowledge as well so now it's indeed on both uh, layers and now uh, indeed uh, I work closely with, uh, with people, with experts, with makers, researchers uh, from Ukraine. 
Yeah, and I really enjoy putting them also together with uh, with people from from the Netherlands because, as the experience shows, the collaborations and the exchange are so rich and so rewarding and, and fulfilling. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing it more. Nice, Maya. Uh, yeah, for me it's interesting. Um, it worked the other way around. Because uh, we're working with the wool of the sheep, and then the more I got to know about how we work, how we in the Netherlands uh, deal with this uh, wool, and also finding out also about the the, the many how would you say it uh, hobbyists, um, and also the atmosphere which is which is around that. Uh, I really felt more and more this is not where I uh, relate to. And finding out meanwhile about, I knew already quite a lot about also um, other textile techniques in, in Ukraine. So it made me feel more relating to Ukraine and less to the Netherlands. So, uh, and even, so then uh, with the weaving, when Ruslana was working it and we were working together, it was the, there was such a kind of, um, how would you say it? Uh, it's so pure and natural without making it romantic, but it's simply as it is. And then if you look at what, what in the Netherlands we are doing with wool and uh, you see what's happening there, then it's, 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 it's not only uh, a matter of taste, it's not only ugly, but I think but this is a matter of taste. It's really also a matter of a completely different attitude. And then uh, I like the Ukrainian attitude more. Interesting. Um, my second question would be uh, related to a very other aspect, uh, and that is um, the 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 connection with uh, with rebuilding and and the idea of heritage. Uh, because what I was intrigued in in when you both were talking was the the relationship of uh, material and immaterial heritage and uh, when you look at intangible or immaterial heritage the whole basic idea is or, or let me start with physical heritage the idea is when you want to preserve that or want to keep it uh, you have to to almost uh, freeze it so to it has to stay exactly as it is the whole idea with immaterial heritage is almost the opposite. So even in the official UNESCO rules, uh, they say uh, immaterial heritage can only be listed if it's been uh, brought in by a group who is still practicing that kind of tradition. Uh, but because they are practicing it, it has to stay alive and it has to renew and it has to innovate and it has to all the time evolve, de develop and, and innovate in a way. And therefore I was thinking that, that you, I think your whole project is much more about immaterial heritage than about material heritage. And if this kind of thinking could not be an entry into the th thinking of how you renew cities uh, because then you have the link to to the innovation and and the renewal i don't know who of you would yeah. well i can uh, i can start some as well uh, good question it made me think uh, first associations to think like first like this ukrainian songs right that are sang and this legend that uh, used to be like told and there was no way to write them down. So one tells and then another retells and each time it's a, it's a different version and it still stays uh, uh, like a, a heritage. And the same uh, is with Burish recipes, in fact. So it's like, because we talked already about Burish since we did, each family has a, a family recipe and there is no one, the one Ukrainian recipe, right? So each each has each family has a recipe and uh, uh, the soul in material heritage. But then, uh, what 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 interesting for me is basically the context, right? So in, in if we take Bursh as an example and a family which has a family recipe, okay, you have a base, you have Bursh and some main ingredients, but then you put uh, the context in. For example, there is a family who is a vegetarian, right? There is someone who is 
allergic to to something or someone doesn't like beans i hated beans when i was a kid and then you adapt to that to the context so for me you know the topic of heritage context is the main um, is one of the main things how do you combine heritage with a specific context and the context could be a, a geography or the conditions around you and then uh, that's that's where the nice uh, game dance 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 begins uh, and that that also was an example in our exhibition because okay we were making an exhibition about ukraine but then uh, we had a context of Dutch design week which is in the netherlands which is in eindhoven and for us it immediately felt okay of course we could take a way to take this preserved silk uh, which are, are considered ukrainian and show it but then they would look completely isolated so it was really about finding this balance how to show that immaterial heritage but also fit it into the context and not to make it dutch but how to find this balance and i guess uh, if we talk about uh, rebuilding and all types of all type of creating of something new that's always the balance of uh, of this, of this well, if I may add to it, I think this is also why the circularity was so important, or because then um, uh, it's it, we we have a tendency to to especially with rebuilding that you have the idea that you need to choose, and also that we have a tendency that we need to already have uh, when we start to do urban planning, et cetera, but also with building, that you have the end result in mind so that you already know exactly how it has to look like in the end. While also in a building process, and that was not only because my last article was about this, dare to build more and during the building process, let happen what's happened, but also um, to, uh, to give more, uh, so you have whether it's different materials which are the supply of what's there so let more happen what is there instead of always exactly defining what will end up in the future how you think it must be but also because then the whole idea of the different memories can come in and so I already try to different times uh, to envisage the Mario theater Mario, sorry, Mario Paul uh, Theater. Last year, my last memory of this theater was that we were standing in front of it and there was this huge Christmas tree and everybody was very proud because it was just, was put, you know, as we do it, as we do it, as everywhere, not everywhere in the world, but in Ukraine, they do it as well. So they put it and everybody was happy. There was this Christmas market. And then the next day we came at the same place and everybody was a bit making fun also because what happened, the wind was, had been blowing this hard and the tree fell uh, down. So uh, this whole, but this is, it was kind of okay, but this can happen and how are we going to organize it? So there was no stress, there was no panic, there was simply fun. And how are we going to, to repair this? And I think this is kind of symbolic for how you can look at all type of places and memories. So you can try to have the, the tree and exactly at the same spot and with the same ornaments and exit. Or you can just look at it and think, okay, maybe we should change something or we do it in a different way. And so this also relates to, for me, the image to the theater behind it. What happened in that theater was kind of, this is so incredible that you cannot imagine it. But do we have to relate to it or can we relate to other stories? And actually this is, uh, it, it becomes possible to think about it also in urban planning and in rebuilding if you add in uh, the possibility for people to tell those stories. And then you can feed the people who are planning and then you can go back and forth in these ideas and then things can come into existence. But this is of course, um, challenging because we are used to building as fast as possible and also with as much as possible already the clear end result. Yeah. And I think I like then the example of Dasha's mycelium uh, gunyas because when she makes them she doesn't try to make any pattern in it because the mycelium gives the pattern, it makes the pattern. So you have the outlines, you define what you would like to have, the template, but then you let it grow. Yeah, that's very interesting thought. And I, uh, 
Uh, I know uh, architect who is kind of forerunner in in uh, working with uh, let's say circular materials and and, and future orientated materials. And he is also claiming that there will become a total new typology of building that is determined through basically uh, the material and, and the way it's building. And, and therefore, it's exactly uh, what you say. Uh, it's not predetermined uh, for, from your outset of how you want it to, to, to look or be, but it's being formed along the way, let's say. Um, other questions from our viewers from outside, maybe somebody wants to add something or ask something. Because if not, we are slowly, I think, uh, coming to a closure of this. Before Dasha, you're completely outside somewhere in uh, frozen cold. Um, no, it's, it's it's okay. I was uh, I planned because I'm uh, in in Maastricht. I just came, and I knew I I live, I used to live in Maastricht uh, three years ago, and I knew like a place where there was always internet with good connection. So I was really prepared. I came twenty minutes in advance before five our time is five and then they told me ah we have uh, new rules since a while ago after five uh, no internet no wi-fi and i was like no <laughs> that was my plan so i found a square in the park uh, which is also nice <laughs> okay well it, it works perfect but, uh, no i'm actually very inspired by people who are now in ukraine how i see now with all the circumstances no electricity, no heating, no what what they do and what they still manage to do. This is wow, fascinating. So Yeah, it sure is. And uh it's a weird uh, circumstance. It's not a statement that you're trying to make, but it's no, a weird no. uh, coincidence. It's, uh, it's just the uh, inspiration, yeah. Yeah. And inspired by yeah. For sure. As said, uh, I, I, I will repeat what I, I said uh, in, in the very beginning of this lecture that we are in the future uh, very much uh, relying on circumstances or de dependent on, on the circumstances. We'll try to uh, make also the YouTube versions more interactive. Uh, but also now, please, uh, there is an, an uh, email address there and uh, address us uh, at Roskvit to ask questions to our, our speakers. And we will, of course, forward them and uh, they will, of course, answer them. At least I uh, hope I can say that uh, for you. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for, for your time, for your explanations, for your thoughts. And uh, uh, we'll for sure stay in touch. And... Uh, to all the people uh, keep on following the next ones and lots of uh, strength uh, for ukrainians thank you for watching margo you want to do some final ukrainian uh, greetings yes thank you so very much uh, everyone who found time to join us today online and we will see you at our coming lectures uh, conducted by the urban coalition Rosquip. please uh, follow us in social media and uh, we will inform you about the coming lectures and events soon thank you very much everyone dear colleagues let us wrap it up thank you very much